Good morning. Okay, let's do a quick check. Who has actually had real caffeine? Oh, shit. Come on. The rest of you? What was it? Coffee? Coffee wasn't good enough for you? Okay, well, we'll see. Hopefully, I can help you get your energy flowing this morning. So, as was mentioned, I am a designer, um, but I'm also a sociologist. Uh, when I was studying design, I got really obsessed with humans and the complexity of said humans. And so I decided to start a career in looking at the way in which design can be used to design the world differently. And so it's taken me on a really strange career path, but essentially I design tools that help people think differently about how the world works. I use design as a catalyst for change, and I challenge the status quo through creative interventions. Like recently I worked with um, the Finnish education system to design an educational tool on circular thinking that's being rolled out across high schools around Finland, which if you're not familiar is known as having one of the world's best education systems, which is super exciting to think that the future creative Natives of the world will also be thinking about some of the big, important challenges that we face. I was actually, as was mentioned, named Champion of the Earth by the United Nations Environment Program, and I laugh because when I received the phone call, I was a little bit like, this is a thing? <laughs> okay. And it was funny, because when you get given a laureate title like Champion of the Earth that you then have to spend the rest of your life living up to, it kind of makes you reflect a little bit on the choices you've made in life. And so actually as a result of that, with one of my key collaborators, I developed this uh, toolkit that everyday humans can embrace. The superpowers that we have at our ready availability. The superpower of getting shit done. The superpower of being wrong. And these are the kinds of tools that I believe bring us the agency and capacity to make more influential changes in our work and in our lives. Essentially, design is one of the most powerful tools that we have. And I have uh, been a design educator for years, and recently I started a school for adults and recovering designers, people who often went through their traditional education and felt frustrated by the fact that their skill set wasn't meeting the world's problems that they saw in front of them. So I created something called the Unschool of Disruptive Design, where we run experiential learning journeys that pop up all over the world. They're seven-day immersive experiences based on a city, and we show case amazing uh, people who are doing stuff in social innovation and using design in different ways. So we run programs in Mumbai, in Cape Town, South Africa, maybe in Budapest. And this has really taught me something about humans, and that is that a lot of people really care about the planet. It's just that they're not given the opportunity to talk about it. It's a little bit like the secret in everybody's closet. Most people care. It's just that the society, the system that we live in, doesn't necessarily enable people to have conversations about the concerns that they have. And this has been really inspiring for me because what I've realized is that there is a palpable optimism if given the opportunity to discuss and to actually work on these challenges that we face. And to that point, most recently, I started one of my most ambitious and strange projects is I bought an old farm in Portugal. <laughs> And I've been renovating this and uh, exploring the way in which we can use nature as a tool for learning. There's a lot of science right now that demonstrates that humans being so disconnected from the natural environment is having all sorts of cognitive and social negative impacts. And apparently three days in nature can give you the same number of like fighter cells in your body that are positive um, than taking many other medications. So there's like this incredible opportunity that nature has in reinforcing our strength and ability to do things in the world. I've learned a lot from having a farm and designing a big project like this. It's not the topic of my talk, but if you come and find me later, I will wax lyrical on baby donkeys. It's very fun. What I want to talk to you about today is how do we design a future that works better than today? because I believe that that's one of the biggest challenges that we face. I'm a huge fan of Buckminster Fuller. If you do not know who this man is, please do yourself a favor and Google him. If you are a designer with any sense of commitment to the possibility of design, this is the man that you should be reading. I'm a big subscriber. In fact, all of my work comes down to this fact, that there's no point using our energy to fight the existing system. If we don't believe in it, we should design something that makes the old obsolete. 
I think many of you in this room probably subscribe to that in one sense or another. You're in design because you are at the edge of creating something new all the time. And the thing about design is it doesn't matter if it's 2D or 3D or whatever platform or tools that you use, whether you're a fashion designer, industrial designer, UX designer, architect, landscape architect, you know, I could go on for ages. Design is one of the most powerful tools that humans have created. We literally design the world, and the world then in turn designs us. Design is a scripter for society. It governs and dictates so many things, whether it be bad design that's throwing elections, or whether it be how we all have tech neck now from being obsessed with our phones. Like our physical bodies, you guys complained about the chairs last year. That's such a designer thing to do. <laughs> Essentially, design is with us from the moment we are born to the moment we die. Every single second of our lives is scripted by design. If it wasn't, we would still be naked on a forest floor. And yet, we often don't see the power of design in these subtle cognitive ways of shaping the future that we're going to have. So design has these incredibly profound impacts on the brain. I'm sure many of you know this. And as UX designers, you're probably already familiar with the classic case of how Amsterdam Airport was able to resolve the very important problem of too much urine missing the urinals at the airport. You familiar with this one? No? So apparently, Amsterdam Airport, lots of people couldn't quite make it into the hall. So they made this very, very, very small design intervention, which was to put a fake fly in all the urinals. And they managed to reduce spillage by 80%. When I mentioned this to a group of uh, people who came to the UnSchool, I, being a lady, have not really got uh, experience with using this product, so I'm not so sure about how this would work cognitively. But apparently, one guy said, well, if you have a water pistol, Layla, you're obviously going to fire it at something. So ultimately, the thing is, is that small interventions in our environment have these cognitive impacts. And why is that so? Because the human brain is a beautiful hot mess, let's be honest. The thing about the human brain is, as we've evolved over millennia, we have safely locked in the most important part, our limbic system. The limbic system is our emotional cortex. It's the pink bit on this diagram. And essentially, it's what controls our understanding of the world through the inputs that come into our brain. And I'd like to break it down really simply here. Our brains are making a lot of shit up for us. They are interpreting the world so that we don't have to waste lots of valuable energy, because our brains use a large percent of our physical energy, in order to make decisions. If we had to actually make the conscious decisions on every single interaction that we had, we would probably fall down. Our brains respond to stimuli and then make interpretations of the world, OK? So, being a UX conference, I have a challenge for you all. I'm going to give you a little challenge. I'm going to trigger what's called a schematic reference, and I need you to play along. So what I need you to do is when I say the next few words, I need you to look inside your brain about how your brain responds to the things I say, OK? So you've got to do some internal brain reflection. OK, I'm going to say the words now. All right. It has four legs and a flat top. What is it? Wow, there's one person who can speak. That's amazing. The rest of you, what was it? Table, did anyone see a dog first? And then did you have this moment where the dog's legs quickly, the top of the dog got erased, and then suddenly there's a flat table? Yes? OK. I can read your minds. Actually, more to the point, I can insert things into your minds. Let's do one more. OK. It's round. It's orange, and it bounces. What is it? What kind of ball? Basketball. OK, did you all have a little moment where you were like, you saw like an orb or a moon, and then you saw an orange, and you thought, pfft, pfft, she's stupid. And then suddenly, I say it bounces, and you're all like, oh, it's a basketball. Did, did that happen to a few of you? Yeah? Basically, the thing is, is that the way in which the brain works, these beautiful, complex human brains is that they're very easily manipulated, manipulated, and they're very easy to work with, as many of you, I'm sure, in the profession of UX know. They say, they being neuroscientists, that actually over 80% of our cognitive processing is done 
subconsciously in that limbic system. We don't know about it. We're making decisions left, right, and center. Our brains are making things up for us as we go about interacting with the world in order to survive. And what does this mean? Well, it means that over time, humans have developed all of these cognitive biases. I like to call them great blunt. Oh, I like to call them words that come out very quickly all at once. Brain glitches. And the thing about cognitive biases is that we have lots of them. Everybody has them. Okay. So, since you guys are so good at interacting, does anyone know of any cognitive biases off the top of their head? Just great. confirmation bias. Excellent. Haha. <laughs> You and I are sinking. So confirmation bias is basically a predisposition to uh, finding information that reinforces what you already believe. There's a lot of echo chamber concepts that we see at the moment, which is essentially playing off confirmation bias. There are literally hundreds of cognitive biases that neuroscientists have found. And one of the really prevailing ones right now is a negativity bias, where, unfortunately, humans have a, a higher cognitive weight when something is negative than when it's positive, which is thus uh, manipulated through a lot of the user experiences that we have. So let me just explain it. If you are walking down the street and you find 100 euros, you're going to feel pretty good. You're going to go shout everybody around you some beers. Well, if you're Australian, that's what you do. And you're going to feel pretty good. But if you walk down the street and you discover that you lost 100 euros, the experience from the science says that you will feel the pain for at least double the time that you felt the joy of finding the hundred bucks. So cognitively, negativity has a much greater weight. And this connects to another very complex um, set of cognitive biases, such as loss aversion. OK, so imagine you're lining up for something. Let's say you're lining up for, I don't know, French fries, OK? And you're in a line and it's taking forever, and you get halfway down the line, and by this point, you're really fed up, but you have this problem because you've just invested all of this time, right? This is called the sunk cost to this point, halfway down the line. And now you're like, I'm going to lose out on the, the French fries, and I lost this time, and you have this like internal battle that manages to play out where you're trying to decide whether or not the loss, investing in the further loss is greater than the loss you've already had. Yes? I see a few people nodding. They're like, yeah, I've had this experience all the time. French fry lines, they kill me. <laughs> so the thing is, is that we have all these cognitive biases. There are lots of them. They play out in microseconds throughout our lives, and they're influencing our perspective of the world, how we interact with the world. And of course, as UX designers, a lot of people are manipulating these in order to get users to do particular things. And at the end of the day, what is important to me is how this plays out with regards to whether or not, as a species, we figure out how to deal with the problems that we face on this planet, be it social or environmental or political. Because there is also things like the status quo bias, where humans uh, have a preference to maintain what already exists. And this connects to cognitive dissonance, where people also don't like um, the discomfort of having two or more beliefs that are contradictory. And so they often, when confronted with a dissonance, a gap, between what they believe and what they do, most people don't change their beliefs, sorry, don't change their behaviors, they change their beliefs. And these kinds of things are playing out at all sorts of levels around the world, whether it be from political or whether it be also in how we treat the planet of which we all come from. Because there's one thing about being a human, other than all having very complex brains, is that we are biological beings. We are made of the same stuff that we put in our bodies to eat. Sorry, just had a little funny brain thought there that I just didn't proceed down first thing in the morning. We all have these needs. We must eat food, we must breathe, we need clean water, and these biological needs mean that we have a biological imperative to sustain the systems that provide us those for free. For example, we all have to breathe. This is a very, very, very well-known scientific fact that even certain politicians have to breathe oxygen the oxygen that is produced via trees and mainly photoplankton in the oceans. And if you don't really believe me that you are in an interconnected, interdependent relationship with a bunch of photoplankton in the ocean, then you should just hold your breath and see what happens. It's good because of the brain. We have evolved over millennia for it to not be physiological possible for you to kill yourself by a self-suffocation by holding your breath so it's safe to play along at home. Just don't pass out. So we have these biological needs. We are completely disconnected from them. In fact, right now, in fact, this article just came out yesterday. 
that uh, the World Health Organization says that every year, seven billion people are killed through air pollution just by breathing. Seven, did I say billion? Million, there's only 7.4 billion people on the planet. That would be a very quick way to deal with population problems. So ultimately, the very act of breathing is also a pretty tragic uh, death for a lot of people. And this reminds us of the fact that we as a species are dynamically interconnected with the planet. You cannot deny it. We cannot suddenly move to Mars and build all of the complex natural systems that provide us with the things that we need to, to live, right? That's just not possible. And not only that, the natural systems that make us alive, we also have developed all of these things that make our lives extremely enjoyable, right? We have created this beautiful, complex, hot mess of industrial systems that bring us products and services at the click of a button. So let me ask you a question. I have three things up here. There's something that unifies them. It's a common environmental problem right now. What is it? And I'm just going to stand here until someone calls out the correct answer, so it's going to get really awkward. Plastic, oh, very good. What, pi what type of plastic? It's too early, she can't respond, it's too early. And it's someone who's had a lot of caffeine, perhaps, could respond. Type of plastic. It's going to get really awkward. I'll give you a hint, it's small. Microplastics, great, okay, good. I got that quickly. So basically, this is um, uh, simulating microbeads that are in uh, face products that are now banned in a lot of countries because they just discovered it a couple years ago. Oops, what a stupid idea. Um, and then also we have microfibers. Most of our fabrics now have uh, synthetic fibers in them. They strip as we wash our clothes. Um, they get, end up in the ocean. And the last one is the one that fascinates me the most because clearly I'm a nerd on this shit. And that is car tires. The biggest contributor to microplastics in the ocean are car tires. And when you hear that, you're like, of course, they go bald on the road with a drain to the ocean. <laughs> but when you don't, we don't think about these things, right? Like, our day-to-day -day lives are completely disconnected from these systems. The thing about this is this does impact all of us. The fact that our uh, car tires are leaching microplastics is impacting every single one of you in this room because you all eat salt. And the science is now showing that every single salt on the market, bar a couple countries, is contaminated with microplastics. And just this week it came out that human stool is filled with microplastics. So you are shitting out the plastic that your car shedded its tires on the road. Just to put it bluntly. So the thing is, is that environmental impacts don't just affect us because we breathe air, it also affects us because we eat things, and it turns out the planet is just one massive digestive system <laughs> that we are a part of, and that everything has to go back into nature at some point. And everything that we do as individuals in our personal lives and in our professional lives, they impact these things. Because we live on a planet full of systems, not just natural systems, but all of the systems we've created, like bureaucracy, which makes no sense whatsoever, but nonetheless controls and orders society, and of course the industrial systems and then the amazing technological systems that we've created, these are all playing out this complex, interconnected world that we live in. The thing is, is that humans, though, for the last 200 years have created linear systems, systems that take things out of the ground, they manufacture them into usable goods, and then they deliver them to a hole in the ground a lot of the time. And this linear system is the counterintuitive system to everything else on the planet. Because humans are the only species that creates a waste that cannot be metabolized back into the environment in a way that is not detrimental to all other species. So this is really fun first thing in the morning, right? You guys are having fun, right? Yeah. Don't worry, we'll get to a nice place, I promise. It's just this is the bit in the middle of the story where you feel very uncomfortable. <laughs> if you're not feeling uncomfortable, then you're clearly not listening. Um, okay, so basically what we've done is we've created an economic system that externalizes any environmental responsibilities. And what I think is fascinating with that take-make-waste disposal system, you and I are all responsible for shitty designed products because we have to pay for the removal of those products when we pay our rates to our councils in the cities that we live in. So waste is, is a cost to us, right? Because we have no economic measurement tools to internalize those wastes. But when you look at nature, nature, this magical, wonderful thing that we all really do actually quite like deep down, 
it has only regenerative systems. In fact, there's no such thing as waste in nature. Waste basically is a, 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 a usable product to the fuel something else. And so this concept is what we are now seeing emerge as the circular economy and circular thinking. How do we design our products and our services and our systems, be it digital or physical, that are regenerative rather than just exploitative? Because we cannot deny the fact that despite a lot of problems, we live in one of the safest and most advanced times in all of the history of humanity. And that is an incredible privilege, a privilege that I think that we should all admire and use well. The planet that we live on, the planet that provides us with life, and still to this day, only known planet that has the magic of life, it has finite resources. That's just a reality. And a lot of the issues that we're seeing right now are just because we broke a ton of systems. Like, we just broke systems by extracting and destroying things for our own benefit. And when you look at sustainability as a really kind of fundamental, no fluffy perspective, it's like, let's just figure out how to meet our needs for the 7.4 billion people and potentially up to 10 when we'll have peak population so that we don't destroy the systems that sustain us. Like, that's a pretty simple goal. Like, do more with less, get better at what we do. Take on the challenge that is far greater a challenge than figuring out how to get people to have more efficient parking apps. <laughs> Sorry, it's one of my pet hates, parking apps. I don't know why. See, the thing is, is that we need to figure out how to create the things that we need, the beautiful, desirable, functional, fashionable things that make our lives wonderful, but do it within the biophysical realities of the planet. Like, that's the challenge that we all have. And the way that we do that is we need to design for systems change. Screw the status quo. We need to design things that make the old obsolete. Because every single one of us, in every single moment of our lives, takes actions that have reactions. I like to think of it like, we are all tiny bits of sand that make up a beach which incidentally, we're running out of sand as well, just to throw another great thing in there, first thing in the morning. So here we have these um, 17 goals that the United Nations came up with um, uh, a couple of years ago, the, the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, they are a big sweep of like, hey, if humanity figures these things out, we're gonna be good. Let's just all work on them. I'm personally a big fan of the one that looks like baby poop, number 12, sustainable production and consumption, because the things that we produce and the things that we buy have massive impacts, and all of us buy stuff. So it's like a really great point to start, figuring out how to be more sustainable and regenerative in our day-to-day -day practices. But we have all these big problems that we face as well, like climate change, and I find climate change a fascinating thing, other than because it's a big problem. I find it interesting how so many people deny its existence, like, really love to pretend like this is not happening, even though in the last three years alone, nearly all of us have experienced some sort of whack weather event. Like, the very fact that it's this hot here right now, that's a bit weird. This whole summer in Europe was upside down. In Maloca, is it Maloca? No, is that how you say it? In Spain? How do I say it? Thank you, it's my Australian accent. <laughs> They had like pouring rain and thunderstorms whilst it was boiling hot in, in Finland in the middle of summer, right? Things are upside down. There are freak weather events constantly. Anyway, I'm not going to bore you with the science of climate change. I want to talk about why there isn't more of a collective action around this. And I find that this is also where we get into that messy human brain scenario. I feel like we're blinded by the scale. Most people feel insignificant to the size of the problem. In fact, I work with people all over the world, CEOs through to five-year-olds, and most of the five-year-olds get it, by the way, the CEOs, not so much. But what I've discovered is that most people feel that they are just one small, tiny piece of this massive, massive machine, and it's just too much, and it's overwhelming, and they just want to drink whiskey and stay in their bed when they read about catastrophic climate change. Yes, anyone agree? Maybe it's another alcoholic beverage instead? But people feel overwhelmed, and they feel like the problem is bigger than them, and that governments just need to get their world sorted out. But I think that one of the reasons that we haven't had global action on climate change is because we are all deeply scared of things. Not just climate change, but just everything in general at the moment. Remember the negativity bias? 
it's being like ramped up a lot through the media, through our social media, through our conversations with friends. Let me explain a little bit more about what's going on here. Fear is a cognitive disabler. It literally turns half of your body off. The limbic system that I showed you at the beginning, it has this thing called the fight, flight, or freeze response. Who here finds what I'm doing right now, speaking on a stage, paralyzing? So fear of public speaking is a classic one, but most people, they don't run off the stage, they tend to freeze, right? They have a physiological meltdown, and their body just goes, I'm not doing this. These kinds of reactions occur for any form of stimuli. But a lot of the time, it's our brain essentially just being like, you know what, kiddo, this is a little too much for me to deal with. I'm out of here. I'm just going to peace out, going to pretend like we're not here. And this is what happens when we get constantly overstimulated with fear inputs. It disables us. And there's a lot of science that's showing that a lot of the communication around climate change and around massive environmental issues has done a huge disservice because it perpetuates this idea that it is be bigger than all of us. It is bigger than all of us, and we cannot solve this problem, so why bother? And let's just, have, let's just wait until the Armageddon happens, and then I'll go bunker down in our bug outs. Anybody else who's prepping for the end of the world? I read a lot about that recently. It's quite funny. Um, it's bigger than all of us, and what I have learned over the years of doing this, of working in change for social and environmental benefits for all of us, is that the big deficit that we have is that we're not taught, nor encouraged, nor actively working on learning to love problems. And just think about that for a moment. Most people avoid problems. I mean, designers, okay, fine, we're like paid to solve problems. But really, like when you encounter these big, overwhelming, insurmountable problems, most people feel pretty like, you know, it's not really my problem. I literally have people say to me, thank you so much for doing what you do. It's really great to know that there are people out there doing things for the planet. I'm like, why is it my freaking responsibility? This is not fair. It's not fair. <laughs> but I am deeply excited by the possibility because one thing I know to be true is that the future is undefined. Even if you go and pay five bucks for a uh, crystal ball reader or a tarot card reader, you will not actively ever know the future, nor will all the scientists in the world, because the future is made up of the actions that we take today. And that gives us immense possibility, possibility to design the systems that leapfrog the problems. So I challenge you to think about how all of these problems I'm presenting to you actually hold their own solution. If you undo them and reconfigure them, because everything is interconnected and we live in this dynamic relationship. And unfortunately, though, we have created a culture where we create today's solutions that eh, very quickly they become tomorrow's problems. And technology is one of those. I love technology, I'm a massive fan of where we've gotten to. But I think that technology will always change the world. That's the whole point of it, from when we first developed hammers to iPhones. But technology alone will not save us from ourselves. For example, data, data farms. Right now, it's predicted that 20% of the world's energy will, and carbon emissions will be, by 2025, all t entirely dedicated to data. All of your little, like, Instagram snaps of your cool shiitake mushroom stir fry sucking up data. And like, we all know this, right? We all know that data is like the new big elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about because we all feel good when we're sharing our lives with everybody that we don't know on the internet. <laughs> so ultimately, we have a lot of these issues that are becoming tomorrow's problems and that we will have to figure out how to address them then. And my problem is like, why don't we just figure out how to address them now through better design? I'm going to give you some examples of how, unfortunately, without really cool foresight, we often create these unintended consequences. OK, so this is a, is a... We got an Americans in the room? OK, you guys, what is this? What are these? They, well, they, no, they're not the creamers, they're the actual coffee, they're the K-cups. Little plastic cups filled with coffee. They're kind of the predecessor to the Nespresso and the other on-demand coffee products that are now flooding the market. And 60 billion is the number that have been sent to landfill in the last few years. Now, the thing about these cups, they were designed to solve a problem. 
uh, the guy who created them worked in an office, and I don't know if you've been to America, but American coffee tends to be in the glass things with the, and it comes into the, and it sits there on the hot thing, and it tastes like crap. Sorry, it does. I'm Australian. We're very snobby about coffee. And so this guy, having a problem with this, he noticed that in his office, everybody was pouring it down the drain, thus wasting a lot of coffee. So he took on the challenge, there must be a better way of making a single shot of beautiful coffee on demand whenever you need it. The guy ended up in emergency. He was testing espresso shots so much, he thought he was having a heart attack. He just had too much caffeine in his body. So he developed this product. He sold it for 50,000 bucks to K-Cup, to, um, sorry, to the company that now owns it. And he deeply, deeply regrets it on public record because of the environmental impacts. He has this huge remorse for the impact that he's had, and there's this huge campaign in the States to get rid of these products because they're just so tragically environmentally damaging. You cannot recycle them. They're really thick pieces of plastic. They, they entomb coffee, right? And the thing about organic material like coffee going to landfill is that it actually produces a 25 times more potent greenhouse gas called methane, so if we could just get all organic material out of landfill, we would dramatically change our carbon situation. And another example, a little further back in history, is radium. Who discovered radium? Oh, you're all so talkative. It's so cute. Yep, anyone? You've got to know this. Mary Carey, that's right. Mary and her husband discovered radium. What is radium? Is it good for you? Do we all like radium? Is it? You're laughing. You're laughing because you're like, no, it's toxic. It gives you cancer. In fact, Murray Curry's notebooks are still so radioactive that nobody can look at them. Now, the thing about radium is when it was first discovered, you've got to think about it back in the day. It was like, that's pretty magical. It glows in the dark. So what do you think people started doing with radium? They started painting it on lots of things. And not only did they paint them on watch faces, and all the women who were painting them died from radium poisoning, but also they thought it was a magic elixir, and they started making products like this one, where you could have radium water, or you could go and have radium bath treatments. I am not making this up. This is really what happened. For this guy's laughing. He can't believe it. They even made, wait for it, radium cosmetics so that you could glow. Seriously. This is a reality that for a long time, in fact, you can still on eBay find the original radium products. I don't suggest you buy them. I really don't. <laughs> not if you believe in science. The thing is, is that knowledge should change our behavior. Knowledge should change our technology. We should be in a constantly, iteratively spiraling up, solutions-loving society that figures out how to make sure that the future is always better than the past. But the thing about the radium story and the K-Cup, and I have like hundreds of these stories, is that they're all just like funny because you have hindsight. You can look back and be like, oh, those stupid people. But unfortunately, hindsight is not a luxury that we have right now because of the scale and the magnitude of the problems. But this is not to say that not every single one of you in this room has the capacity and power to influence the types of products and services that ultimately end up influencing the world. Because a lot of us work in areas where we actively create addictive systems, like this whole concept of dark patterning, where design is intentionally manipulating people's behavior to fleece them of money or to uh, control their direction through a user experience. A lot of the big technologists are coming out against the systems that we have all been created. Um, we've all been, I don't, I'm not going to say duped, because I'm really into continuous scroll. Like, I get a kick out of every time I use it, and I know it's a problem. And I know that it's just giving me a dopamine rush, because it's like a slot machine. And I know I'm going to find a new article on brain science that I love. But it, I don't really have a lot of autonomy in that situation, because the system is actually hijacking my uh, neurochemical receptors and forcing me into a little cycle of time-wasting and internet clicking. In fact, just yesterday, the New York Times created this article about how most of the tech giants are refusing to let their kids have screen time, because according to the previous editor of Wired magazine, it's a little bit like crack cocaine. So we create these systems of addiction. We don't understand what the outcomes will be. We do not understand what tomorrow's problems will be as a result of it. And for me, this is about ethics and morality and choices and our own philosophies on life. Like, why don't we do what we do, right? Money's always useful. Everybody likes to get paid. 
but also we have the possibility, those of us who have been educated, those of us who live in advanced societies, we have the possibility to do things way better than the past. To design something completely different and to acknowledge that humans have and will always change the world, but we can change the world to be something better than it was and hopefully better than it is right now. Because humans, you know, we have our messed up brains and all, but we are really quite beautiful things sometimes. We're really social. We're a clan animal. We like other people like us. We know that emotions are contagious. We have these things called mirror neurons. If I smile weirdly at any of you in the front row too long and make eye contact with you, then you'll have to smile back. He's really resisting it, but oh, he's got to smile because actually our brains are wired to mimic other people. That's why they say if you want to make friends, you should like mimic the body language of strangers that you're trying to talk to. It's really weird when you watch people do that. Um, but ultimately, emotions are contagious and we have this thing called social proof where what we're always looking in any situation subconsciously, we're looking to see what other people are doing and then we mimic it. So think about this, you can seed behavior. Just like I seeded what I could see in your brain with the schematic reference trigger, you can seed positive or negative behavior in the people around you or in the technology that you design, or in the offices that you work in, or the homes that you live in. Behavior is contagious. So if we're constantly reinforcing the negativity bias and the stereotypes that everything's screwed, then that is what the future will end up being. We are also very easily misdirected. There's a really fantastic, um, uh, I guess he's a philosopher, George Larkoff, he wrote Don't Think of the Elephant in the Room. And he talks a lot about how uh, politicians, certainly a lot that we have today, in today's society, use misdirection, where they cognitively confuse you so that you are, your brain is hijacked. And you know what misdirection is from? Misdirection is from magic. So magicians use misdirection to uh, suspend your need to understand reality and to believe in the magic. I love magicians. They're really cool because they have this amazing ability to completely hijack your mind and then you get all of the fluffy feelings when you go, how did he do that? Or she did that. The thing is, is that a lot of the technologies and the systems that we've designed now are using these same systems to manipulate us into being in these like continuous cycles. And if you're interested in this kind of stuff, I strongly recommend you look into dark patterning and some of the kind of call-outs that are going on right now around that. I'll just let it stay there long enough for you to get all your phones out. It's like, it's like oh, suddenly everyone's... So ultimately, we have this opportunity to tune our ethical compasses as creatives, as designers, as influencers in the worlds that we live in. And I challenge you to think about what that is for you. What are the personal philosophies that you live by? What is it that you bring into your work that has the potential to make those small shifts that have that social proofing of something else? I'm a fan of Einstein. Although oh, poor Einstein, I mean, the guy was a bloody vegetarian and then he contributed to the nuclear world. I mean, I feel like he also married his cousin, which is weird. But, you know, poor guy, smart man, I think we all like Einstein, made this very important point that we can't solve problems with the same thinking that led us there to begin with. And that is unfortunately what we have. We have a linear mindset. Most of us were taught in a linear system. Most of us work in linear environments. And unfortunately, that means that we only kind of focus on the top of the iceberg, the really obvious stuff that's happening around us, rather than investigating the kind of chunk of what's sitting under the iceberg. Systems thinking is essentially a tool that helps us understand the complexity of the world so that we can reconfigure it. It is a little bit like a magic superpower, which is why it's on my superpower set that you can look up online. I like to describe it as there are three main interconnected circles going on in the world at any given time. And the most important is the social system that essentially is reinforcing a lot of these problems, right? So we have education and politics and um, the economy. These are all totally socially constructed things. They don't exist if humans don't exist. And they're these like governing forces that ultimately dictate the kinds of products and services and the environmental issues that occur when we produce things that we need and that we reinforce the status quo. But what none of this really reminds us of is that we all need nature, full stop. We cannot avoid it. Just try. <laughs> Actually, don't. That might be dangerous. I don't want to have anybody hurt themselves. Thing is, is that we live on one planet. It's a closed ecosystem. There is no way. Everything ends up here except for space junk. There's a lot of it. Maybe one day it'll just drop back down to Earth. I don't know. And that we disrespect some of the things that are the most important to us, like 
the oceans, there are our collective lungs. It says that by 2050, there's going to be more plastic in the ocean than fish. There's a huge issue with the giant chunks of plastic, not just the small chunks of plastic. It demonstrates this common systems thinking idea of the tragedy of the commons, that nobody's responsible for it, so that it just gets completely exploited. And then we end up with this situation where everybody's thinking recycling's great, everything's fine, I can use my plastic water bottle, it's all good, it's being recycled. And then China decides to stop recycling things because the rate of contamination is so high. I don't know if you're familiar with this, it was about 10 months ago. China and many other Asian countries banned imports of recycling. It sent the recycling market into a total tailspin. In Australia, where I'm from, landfilling, everyone's just landfilling their recyclables. This is happening in a lot of places. Because what the key issue here is that as a society, we've normalized waste. It is so normal to have something with limited value. So recycling as a concept is not a solution unto itself. It actually validates waste. It reinforces a system of disposability and valueless things. And so I'm on a mission to challenge the world to design for a post-disposable future. I'm really impressed by Amuse taking on that responsibility with the initiatives that they've put in place. And every single one of us can make changes in our day-to-day -day lives, in our workplaces, in the things that we create to help bring about a future where we don't continue to perpetuate the problems because we design the mess, we can design ourselves out of it. Full stop. The systems that we've created essentially just make everybody else responsible for the problems that we create. And it's resulted in a really, like, a bit of a cluster, fill in the blanks. But each of us has a sphere of influence, right? Each of us has friends and family and people that we communicate with. We have people that we, um, we work for. We have people we design for. We have a potential to influence those that are around us. I developed something called the Disruptive Design Method, which supports designers and creatives to respectfully disrupt the status quo, to interrupt in systems that you don't agree with. I mean, in this age of Me Too, we know that one of the most important things is that for people to stand up for people who are being disempowered or discredited, right? It's a little bit the same when it comes to things like these big social and environmental issues. We need to be willing to respectfully disrupt the status quo. So learning about the systems, figuring out how to put the pieces together and building, creating, designing solutions that make the old obsolete, having integrity to do something different, because that's what this is all about. I mentioned Buckminster Fuller. He's, has this, he created these things called tensegrity structures, which are structures that hold themselves together based on their own tension. So everything with integrity requires tension in order for it to exist. If anyone has tried to build a building, you will know that there's a play between gravity and reality that makes something exist. So to answer the question that I posed in the beginning, I say that the best way to, de to predict the future is to design it. And so actually, that's what I want to challenge you guys to do right now. Here we are, interaction conference. You're all creative minds. I've just thrown a crap load of problems and opportunities at you. So I'm not going to give you two minutes to turn to a complete stranger and figure out one action that you could take in your professional or personal lives to help address some of these issues. And then I'm going to randomly pick on you and make you say it out loud. Does that sound like fun first thing in the morning? Yay! Yay! OK, you ready? Turn to the person next to you. You've got two minutes, one idea. It's only one idea. It's, I'm not really pushing you here for three. Come on, human interaction. Let's go, okay, go. Go, go, go. I can see you all, by the way, so if you're not talking, I'm gonna come and pick on you. Come on, go, 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 talking to the other humans. Being nice to the, come on, I can see you too. Talk, 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 one idea, I don't care, I don't care. Everyone's participating. One idea. I can see you. There's no mouth moving. <laughs> Yeah, I can see. You keep talking. <laughs> if you haven't found a friend, just rudely interrupt somebody else's conversation. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> These guys are leaving because they don't want me to pick on them. <laughs> I see you. I see you. Yep, I'm going to find you later. <laughs> if you don't have someone to talk to, you can always post an idea 
to that thingy, the talky thingy, the interactive thingy. <laughs> Okay, you got 30 seconds left. Okay. Who's a courageous human who wants to share an idea? Who's got some courage first thing in the morning? Oh, yeah. Okay, yell it out and I'll repeat it. Sorry. Yep, go. Okay, allow people to only throw out trash once per year. You know that in Taiwan, they changed the recycling system where you actually have to pay for the bag before you're allowed to recycle, and they have a truck that doesn't stop. It's like an ice cream truck that plays music, and you have to stand on your street at the same time every day to get to throw your trash out. And if you don't do it right, your neighbors will like, uh, call the police on you. <laughs> but they actually play ice cream truck music. Seriously. And it's free to compost and recycle, but you have to pay for general waste. So yeah, interventions that basically make it more difficult to do the less desirable things, great idea. But what could you do? How could you bring that into your office? You could totally make, you see, this would be funny. You could like just steal everybody's trash bins and then see what happens. You could then charge them to get them back. You could be like the trash bin thief. Yeah, anyone else want to do that? Okay, what, what was your idea? Say it loudly so I can hear. Yes. Yeah, so instead of the plastic water bottles, you have the, the drops that are made from algae, and you can, you can eat them, and the algae is biodegradable. Okay. They have truth bus, but it's made of uh, bamboo, yeah. and it's totally recyclable. And actually, a long time ago, everything that we used, we didn't throw away in two years. Yeah. So now products are created in a way that you will have to change it in four years. Your Planned smartphone. obsolescence is, has been a business strategy. That's so. why I'm from industrial design. Industrial design was developed to create planned obsolescence. Most of our products are designed to break. Really cool movement, the repair movement is helping challenge that. One of my friends, the founder of ifixit.com, if you're not familiar with it, you should totally look it up, is basically having a movement to make repair legal because globally it is still illegal to repair your devices. It's completely whack, yeah. Yeah, but and then the whole market will probably, I mean, it's a lot of money they will lose, these companies, because they are probably building economical systems. Sure, but the circular economy, basically the whole concept of circular design is that we shift from this linear system to one where you offer product service system models, and that's essentially where you change your business model to deliver um, the functionality that the community wants, but in a circular system. So you actually design for the whole system, not just for the bit where somebody buys the product and then it's their responsibility to deal with it at the end of life. Okay, I'm sure there's lots of other ideas, and I have a ticking clock in front of me here. So I suggest if you did come up with an idea, that you post it to that little, and if you didn't, that you ruminate on it for a little bit. But what I really challenge you to think about, and this is the hardest thing, is what is actionable or tangible within your life? Because it's very easy for us to say, well, government should do this, or education should do that, or my boss should do X, Y, Z. And that's really why the problems are perpetuated, because a lot of us take zero responsibility for the impacts that we have and the possibility that we have of influencing the world around us. Because this is the thing that I, if there's one thing that you leave listening to me, what I can, well, you know, you get the point, <laughs> is that the future is undefined. We do not know whether or not catastrophic climate change will allevi alleviate the planet of humans. We have no idea what the future holds, and that is the magic of possibility. That if we overcome the fear that disables us from taking action on the things that we care about, whether it be alleviating poverty, whether it be supporting refugees, whether it be addressing the sixth great extinction that is currently on our table. You know, I met recently a hedge fund investor, very rich man. He was committed to ending factory farming in his lifetime. He was the single biggest investor in the um, alternative meats movement, okay? So, Everybody has the opportunity to do something bigger than themselves, to respect the fact that the world is not a machine, that we are part of this beautiful magic on this planet, and that we should all find ways to bring a little magic into our lives and the world around us. Thank you.
Thank oh. you, Layla. We've got time for some questions. We've got oh, a few that are posted. Um, I actually got handed another one, which I wanted oh, to start okay. with you. Um, so, if you could only think about like the kind of ballooning impact of one action, if you could take one, oh, yeah. redesign one thing, what would it be? Uh, food systems, full stop. Food is one of the biggest environmental impacts. We've completely industrialized the natural system of providing sustenance to our bodies. Factory farming is one of the biggest uh, contributors to climate change. It's also morally reprehensible that we enslave animals for our own benefit. And also food waste. 8% uh, of the world's climate emissions are contributed to food waste, and it's not just aesthetic standards at supermarkets, it's our refrigerators oh, right. that are designed to not keep food fresh. So there's multiple points of intervention in the food system. Also, if we could get organic materials out of landfill, we would dramatically address climate change as well, and have the added bonus of being able to put nutrients back in the soil like nature intended. Yeah. Many things I've learned from having a farm uh -huh. is that in nature, it's like everything magically works together, and it's just when humans come along and decide that this is waste and it's dirty and it should go in a plastic bag and then get picked up by a truck and taken to a big hole in the ground. Mm. That's where we kind of disassociate from the impact. So if you can, in your own um, lives, go for quality over quantity when it comes to uh, meat products. Um, I'm not saying everyone should be a vegetarian. I'm saying that you should go for quality of like preferably non-factory farmed meat products. Um, and also if you can reduce uh, the waste to landfill of organic matter, you will have a significant and immediate impact. And that's a really great thing to bring into the office as well. I once started a basement worm farm in an office building that I worked in, and we had a weekly roster of looking after the worms. There's an idea for you. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. I love it. A worm farm. I wonder how I get permission from our real estate agents, our real estate organization to do that. Um, well, actually, microbiodigesters, so machines that actually take organic material and create methane, and then methane is a power source. Oh. So in Australia and many other parts of the world, they actually um, use the sewerage system to create methane to power houses, yeah. right? Because methane is a natural gas, yeah. essentially. Uh, which is also what we know that animals, pastured animals and, and uh, factory farmed animals, they burp, not fart, a lot of methane <laughs> into the atmosphere uh, because of the fact that they have four stomachs and they're basically micro-digesting organic material. Um, I just would love to see a study on the farting contribution of humans. I don't think I've seen one of them yet. That would be fascinating. Yes, it would. Yes. Yes, it would. Um, so Are I, you I, a fan of... Dirk Gently, yes. yes. Okay, good. Oh, you also, I think Hitchhiker's them. Guide to the Galaxy is one of the best books ever written. And if you yes. don't know what 42 means, you should read it. Yes. There's another one. Am I on Instagram? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, should I not be? I know I shouldn't be. But actually, I think Instagram is, these are escape mechanism from the negativity bias because Instagram is just beautiful things. And no one's mean on Instagram. No one's all like, yo, mm, like, I'm going to you, like on Twitter. Right? Instagram's the nice place. Twitter is the not so nice. Facebook's just the depressing place. So yeah. each of the social media seems to have their, uh, their tone that is reinforced in the social system. Yeah. I love these questions, by I the know. way. I know. There's actually the one I'm curious about is the, does design, does technology push design or does design push technology? Well, it's a little bit of a chicken and an egg scenario, isn't yeah, it? It is. I think that you know, I see that we're in a dynamic relationship. When you look at things from a systems perspective, we have a saying in systems thinking there is no blame. There isn't, mm. actually, because everything's interconnected, it's dynamic, it's evolving, it's emerging. So technology is like, um, like a product of evolution, it's a product of um, applying knowledge to the world around us, and so I think that, you know, with, with, with respect to the power of technology, um, I think we would say that humans drive technology to meet our needs, but in turn, technology drives us. And so we're in this kind of like intimate relationship mm -hmm. that's hard to define where one begins and the other ends. Yeah. So I have uh, one last question. Um, and I, <laughs> I have no idea I'm... about the UN thing, by the way. I yeah. don't know. I just got a phone call one day. Oh, the, which yeah. one is that? about how a designer gets a seat at the UN. But actually, I'm working on a big project right now. If anybody wants to contribute ideas on how to make sustainable living irresistible with the United Nations, and I'm going to the UN General Assembly um, mm -hmm. to discuss this. So if anyone has any ideas they want to contribute, I'm happy to crowdsource creative ideas for these complex problems. So the one I actually had might be at long for 30 <laughs> seconds. Um, but as an individual contributor, mm -hmm. how would you go about persuading 
your employer to, to, do, to make some of the changes that you're talking about? Well, it really depends on the type of employer you have to begin with, because yeah. humans are not homogenous, and every human responds to different stimuli or inputs, different strategies of engagement. So I think that the most important thing is to prove that changes are not going to be detrimental. Most people are scared of change because they have a hypothesis or assumption of what it's going to be like. So however you can prove through this concept of social proof that a shift to an alternative system is not going to be bad, whether that be through case studies, examples, data, whatever you can do. You have to build a case for any change, whether it be the design aesthetics you want for a, a new interface, or whether that be for the reason you should steal everybody's bins in the office and see what happens as a cool social experiment. <laughs> so I think ultimately your boss is also a human who also has to breathe, and there are ways in which you can figure out how to access them and support them in transitions that you can bring to the forefront. But also, I also really strongly promote the idea of subversive design. When your clients come to you with bad ideas, it's your job to misdirect them in a good way. Because most of the time, the design problems are built in from the brief stage. Mm -hmm. Because people want to replicate the systems that they see around them. So it's our job to figure out how to disrupt those systems to create new ones that make the old ones obsolete. Well, let's, uh, let's uh, thank Layla one more time for her wonderful thank you. talk. And thank I you actually, so much. I actually have a, oh, a gift oh, wow, I, as well. I look a little bit like a man. Yes. Awesome. It's very cute. It is, right?